this question on ASD. What is the natural history? What happens to ASDs and patients with ASDs if untreated? Okay, so patients will uh, develop CHF, CH, and okay, so they develop pulmonary hypertension. CHF is quite unusual, but generally, when we are, talk about natural history, it's important also to talk about what are the rates, right? What happens to them? So, less than 3 millimeters generally will close or become smaller. The 1 in 20, 1 in 5 people, that is 20% of the world population, will continue to have a CFO. Right now, when you talk about other ones, 3 to 6 millimeters, right? And this is when we talk about if you see an ASD right at birth, what happens to them? So, 3 to 6 millimeters will close spontaneously in at least 80% of cases. And this is important to know because if you have a patient, for instance, at birth who has a 6 millimeter ASD, we need to be able to tell them what are the chances that this will close, what is the natural history. And generally, 3 to 6 mm, 80% of them will spontaneously close when you see them at birth. And if they close, typically by what age will they close? In what age can an ASD close off? So say you see a baby at birth with a 6 mm ASD, you say, hey, look, you have an 80% chance of this closing. By what age? Typically? Typically by anyone? 1 year, 2 year, 3 year, 4 year. So, the, yes, so typically if it, not one year, much much older than one year. So, typically if it's going to close, it will close by two, two and a half years, maximum by three years. At one year, you still have a chance of it closing. So, that's why typically with ASDs, you know, you see them at birth, they have it, you say come back at one year. They have it at one year, you say come back at two years. After two years, two and a half years, the chances of it closing reduce substantially. Typically by three years, if it's not closed, it's not going to close. And that's why the recommendation of closing it between, you know, two to five years. There's no recommendation to close at one and a half. If you're still two, there's a chance that it can definitely get smaller or close. Eight, uh, if it's more than eight mm, the spontaneous closure is quite improbable and increase. In, in fact, these ASDs can increase in diameter over time. Why do they increase in diameter? Why do they increase in diameter? And you know, patients will ask you this often, like if you have a VSD, will my VSD increase in size? Now generally, VSD will either stay the same or reduce. It doesn't increase. ASDs, on the other hand, can increase in diameter over time. Why is that? Why does it increase? Have you heard of it increasing over time? Hmm? Anyone? So the reason is because they, what, there are a couple of things that happen over time. Because the, the atrial septum is quite floppy, right? It's not a thick septum like the VSD. There's no contraction of the atrial septum the way you have of a muscular septum of an interventricular septum. So over time with this flow, it tends to stretch. The second thing that happens over time, as you know, is your atria get, your right atrium and all get dilated. So as your step, as the child grows and the whole overall heart grows and the overall septum grows, they not grow towards each other. You can have an actual stretch of that septum. The other thing that can happen, especially when they become much older, is as the left ventricular compliance reduces and your LA pressure increases and your left to right shunt actually increases over time, there's a further stretching out. So ASD can either stay the same they can either become smaller, they can close, or they can actually increase in diameter over time. And this is what one has to kind of explain to the patient. Now, when you have an atrial flap, if you look on your echo and you have an atrial flap, by the way, can you all see me? You can see me, right? So when you have an atrial flap, they actually are more frequently associated with spontaneous closure. Um, if you have a PDA, Okay, you have a six-month-old with ASD PDA, 
it's less likely to close. Why is that? Why is it that a PDA, if you have a PDA along with an ASD, it's less likely to close? Anybody? Why is it less likely to close? Anyone? You can type in. Yes, because of more LA return. If you have a PDA, you have more left atrial, more pulmonary venous return, more left atrial return, more left to right shunting. So, when you have an ESD with a PDA, it has a more a negative prognostic significance. And of course, large ASDs are unlikely to close and if they remain large, 5 to 15 percent of them will die in the third decade of life with Eisenmenger's syndrome. Now, presenting as heart failure is quite unusual for ASDs. There are a few situations in which ASDs can present with heart failure. Anyone? Which situations can an ASD present with heart failure? Okay, so if you have a I just everyone mute your Okay. So if you have a social if you have PAPVC, if you have uh MSMR, PAPVC, anything else? Anything else? So MS, MR, PAPVC. And there is an association of patients who have left SVCs. So left SVCs coming into the coronary sinus can cause a relative MS and can actually, this can have more left to right shunting and earlier, earlier incidence of pulmonary hypertension. Okay. Uh, this thing, you know, the uh, thinning of pulmonary vasculature and so on more applies to VSD. But when we talk of ASD with heart failure, MS, MR, associated PAPVCs, associated left FCCs. Yes, common atrium because it's a much larger left to right shunt. Okay, now what is the definition of small, moderate or large? What is small, what is moderate, what is large? Anyone? What is a small ASD? So we can go by size. Generally, no. So a small ASD, anything less than 3 millimeters is a, what is a less than 3 millimeters? Is a patent, foramen, or valid. Right? So a small ASD is categorized as 3 to 6 mm. So anything less than 3 mm is a PFO. That is not a small ASD. 3 to 6 millimeters is a small ASD. Okay? Now, typically in a small ASD, because it's small, there is no right heart dilation. You don't get RARV dilation. What is a moderate ASD? Moderate is 6 to 12 and large is more than 12. Now, some books will tell you moderate is 6 to 8 and more than 8 is large. But I think this is pretty standard. 3 to 6, 6 to 12 and more than 12 become definitely large. Okay, all clear on this? Now, can an ASD run in family? Can you have an ASD that runs in family? Yes, what type? Anyone? What type of transmission is that? Yes, so you can have ASDs that run in family. This is autosomal dominant. As you know, it's seen in, there are two types, Holt or Ram syndrome, where ASDs can run in family. And the other is something which is called ASD with PR prolongation. So if an ASD, normally you get you get a first degree heart block in which type of ASD? In which type of ASD? In primum ASD, right? Uh, in canal. So ASD with secondum ASD with PR prolongation, one subtype where you can run families and hold oral is a typically autosomal dominant. Okay, next question. 
what are the associated cardiac lesions with the secundum AST? Associated cardiac lesions with the secundum AST. It's different for secundum, it's different for primum, and it's different for sinus venosus. So what are associated cardiac lesions with the secundum AST? Ranjit, you can answer to all so that everybody sees. So when we talk about associated cardiac lesion with secundum ASD, what we mean is that the primary lesion is the secundum ASD. And that, so triatresia, of course, you always have to have an obligatory ASD. So TAPVC, generally you have an obligatory ASD. So we won't put those into associated lesions. What are the associated lesions when your primary lesion is secundum ASD? What other lesions should you look for along with it? So PDA is one, yes, you should look. Mitral valve abnormalities. What mitral valve abnormalities? So look, ASD can be associated with BSD, ASD can be with transit, with pair, talk, with anything, right? But with ASD, with, when the primary lesion is secundum ASD, you can have certain associated lesions. So, okay, you can have an MS with an ASD, lutein buckle. Anything else on the mitral valve you must look for. Yes, mitral valve prolapse is one of the known associations with the secundum AST. Any other? MR and PAPVC. Now, you can have a whole host, as I said. You can have triatresia, truncus, VLD, the whole cardiac book can be. But when you have a pure place, secundum AST, right heart dilation, you must pay particular attention to your mitral valve because they can have MVP and they can have MR. And why is MR important? with the secundum AST. Why is it important to look for mitral regurgitation? What can MR do to your left to right shunt? What can MR do to the left to right shunt? It can increase the left to right shunt, right? Because you have MR, so your left to right shunt can increase. So MR can increase your left to right shunt. What can an ASD do, your, do to your MR. What can an ASD do to your MR? So I'm asking you the reverse question, right? So we say MR can increase the left to right shunt across the air. What can an ASD do to an MR? So think about this, right? Yes, when you have MR, you typically get LA dilation. But if you have an ASD, so you're getting left to right. You do not get the LA dilation. So when you have MR jet comes into LA, it goes straight through to the right atrium. So you can underestimate your mitral regurgitation. So please remember this: that in the presence of, in the presence of, okay, in the presence of an ASD, you can underestimate mitral regurgitation. And that is why it's important to look for MR. So what looks to you like mild MR may actually be moderate MR. And you don't have the LA dilation and all your classic features to tell you, oh, this is moderate MR, LA is dilated. So you send that patient to the OR for ASD closure. He gets his ASD closed. He comes out and he has a murmur and you say there's moderate MR and your patient is going to be really annoyed with you. So whenever you have, you're making a diagnosis of secondum ASD, it's very important to look at the mitral valve, look specifically for MVP, look for mitral regurgitation. If you see grade 2 MR, tell your surgeon, hey, you know what, this may actually be grade 3, because once I close, uh, close the ASD, I may unmask the MR. And of course, the other thing to look for is always your pulmonary gain, because you have 10 to 15% of PAPVC when you have an ASD. Okay, all clear on this point? He has a one-year-old, he's got a wide split second half sound, and he has, but he has a saturation of 85%. What do you think of? So as you all know, and I'm not going into clinical features of an ASD, ASD presents with 2 by 6 systolic ejection murmur, wide split second half sound. Yes, so one thing you think of is a common atrium. So if you have a patient with clinical features of an ASD, but he has a cyanosis, you think of common atrium. Anything else you can think of? You can think of a unobstructed PAPVC. Okay, when I put PAPVC, it's not going to be an obstructed 
but an unobstructed TAPVC will present like an ASD, but the only difference is that they will be blue. Uh, secondum ASD will undo left FVC, IVC, blood flow directing to LA. Okay. So, when you have a situation where an IVC is directed to the left atrium, right? And that's very rare. As you know, we always define, we always define our atria 99% IVC drains to which atria? To the right atrium, right? So, let us say this is your right atrium, this is your left atrium. And your IVC should go in here normally, right, into the right atrium. But let us say it is draining like this into LA. Now that means you got systemic venous rats going to your LA. So it's possible that they will be blue. Practically speaking, what tends to happen is when you have an IVC type and you have a large ASD, the blood is going here and then going like this. So they don't become very blue. They are actually pink. But when you go in and if the surgeon does not realize that the IVC is going to LA, and he closes the ASD here. And now you leave the IVC into the LA. Then the patient will come out very, very blue. Okay? So one of the causes of cyanosis after ASD closure is an IVC that is actually draining into the left atrium. So you can think about it if the patient is blue before, but it's generally quite unusual for them to have preoperative cyanosis. Mostly they present with postoperative cyanosis. So when you have a patient with all features of an ASD, but he's blue, you think of combination, you think of unobstructed TAPVC. In unobstructed TAPVC, all the blood is coming right into the RA, and then you've got your RA going right to left. So that is why you are blue. In a PAPVC, in a PAPVC, in partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection, right, what is happening? The pulmonary veins are connecting to the right atrium, right? The other pulmonary veins are going to the left atrium. So, in an ASD with PAPVC, they are not blue, they are pink. Is that clear? See, let you, if, uh, if you have, if you've got your L LA, okay, you've got pulmonary veins coming here. Now, you have a pulmonary vein going to right atrium. Does patient become blue? No. Because pulmonary vein is 100% saturation. All it means is pink blood is going back to pulmonary artery. Pink blood is going back to lungs. So it's a waste of energy. The patient will not do blue. And this is important to know because when you think about it, you know, when you have an ASD and you miss a PATVC and you say, hey, well, he wasn't blue, the fact is he won't be blue. He will be pink. And think about sinus renosis ASD, right? Sinus renosis ASD is are always associated with PAPVC, but they are never blue until late stages. So, PAPVC on the other hand, all the pulmonary veins are coming to right atrium. They are mixing in right atrium. Then that blue blood mixed with pink blood is going right to left to LA to LV to aorta. That's why PAPVC, even if they are unobstructed, will have a desaturation if you take look at the O2 swap machine. Common atriums will also be desaturated because there is mixing within the atria before it goes out. Okay, all clear on this? Clear on this? Any questions? If not, we'll move on to the next concept, which is what determines the left to right shunting in a restrictive versus a non restrictive AST? What determines the left to right shunting? What determines the left to right shunting? So one is the size of the ALT. What else? The RV compliance. So these are the two things which will determine. So when you have a restrictive ALT, right, the size will determine flow. So for instance, if your ALT is 4 millimeters, it's small. It can only have a QPQS of 1.2 is to 1, right? So in a restrictive ALT, Size will determine flow. In a non-restrictive ASD, right, then it's a large VSD or a moderate VSD, which is non-restrictive. There's no restriction between LA and RA. Then size does not determine flow. Then it is the relative compliance of RV versus LV that will determine your shunt. 
and really not PVRI, SVRI. Unlike in a VSD, right? In a VSD, your PVRI, SVRI ratios will determine your flow. In an ASD, it is really your EDP. It is really your complete, your LVEDP versus RVEDP because the pressure in the LA and RA is a low pressure system. So whether it goes left to right, right to left, will be determined by your EDP. Um, so the compliance. So if your LVEDP gets high, then you will have more left to right shunt. If your RVEDP is high, you will have less of a left to right shunt. So it is the compliance of the ventricle which is a major determinant of left to right shunting in a ASD, especially in a non-restrictive ASD. All clear? Okay, next, next concept. Can this left to right shunt increase over time or does it remain the same? Yes or no? Can it increase over time? It can increase. And I gave you the reasons for that. One is the stretching of the ASD. So it can increase over time. The second is as they get older and the, they get ischemic heart disease, they get hypertension, the left ventricle becomes more hypertrophied, there's more scarring of the left ventricular, endocardium, myocardium, all that leads to the elevated EDP. And that elevated EDP makes the LV compliance go up, LA pressure goes up, more or less, right? Chanting. So as you can see, the previous slide which says your flow is related to your compliances. So therefore, as your EDP goes up, your left to right shunting will also go up. And yes, certainly if you get new MR or something else, also will increase your left to right shunting. Okay? So this point is very important to tell patients when you see them, I tell them even at two or three months. Look, I'll see you back at one year. Your ASD may either stay the same, it may become smaller or it may also increase. Because they panic, if they come to you with an 8 mm ASD, then they come back at 12 mm because it is stretched. They say, yeah, doctor doesn't know anything. He told me it's 8 mm, today he's telling me 12 mm. It's important to educate our patients that this can happen over time. It can get smaller. We'll see over time what happens. Okay? All clear on this. Of course, ischemic heart disease and hypertension are a cause only in adults. In younger kids, it's going to be primarily the stretching of the ASD. Okay, if this patient had an ASD, which ASD would it be? Aha, very good. And why is it sinus stenosis? Why did you say sinus stenosis ASD? So on what basis? Why did you say sinus stenosis? Because the P wave axis is what? What is the P wave axis? So everybody sees that? Positive P? P wave axis is? So it says P wave axis is upward, the P wave is negative, right? So everyone look at AVF. Okay. So when you look at an ECG, it's important two things you look at. One is you look at P wave. So if it's upright in one and negative in AVF, right? That tells you that it's a low atrial rhythm going upwards. The and that goes along with the sinus stenosis ASD. In a secondum ASD, it will typically be sinus rhythm, as with a primary ASD. So this is your a very good indicator for a sinus stenosis ASD. Now, if you had the P wave was up, but the QRS was down, then what do you think of? Then you think of primum ASD. So you see the most important lead to look at in an ASD is AVF. Because in AVF, the C wave is down, this is a sinus stenosis. If QRS is down, then this is a primum ASD or a partial ADC. 
So if you think clinically, this patient has an ESD, when you look at your ECG, pay special attention to ADS. We all look at kind of the RSR prime, you know, all that on V1, which is fine. You're looking for right ventricular volume rate. But ADS and the direction of the P wave and the QRS can give you a good clue for sinus venosus versus partial AV canal primary ASD before you even do your echo. So if you don't on echo see any ASD, but you saw a negative P in ADS, you better be thinking this guy has a sinus venosus ASD and I missed that sinus venosus ASD, which is the importance of looking at your ECG before you start your echo or at least make sure you look at that ECG in conjunction with your echo. Okay, so ECG finding we did this. This one, name the ECG findings. Which ASD? So this has, you can see the sinus rhythm, right axial deviation, RVH, right? And RSR prime in V1. Right? So this would be what? Right axis deviation, RSR prime in V1, which type would this be? This would be your secundum ASD. This one? So again, we look here. Negative QRS. Positive C wave. The minute you see this, primum ASD. So AVF and V1 are your two important groups to look at in terms of determining your ASD. Okay, diagnosis here. Can you all see the echo? Okay, primum ASD, what else? MR, what else? What about the MR? Yes, you could call it a transition. Don't see much of a ventricular component at all there. What about this MR? Cleft, right? You can see there's a cleft. So this would go with your primum ASD with a cleft. Partial AV canal. Now, also, anyway, just as a side thing, you can see that there is a malalignment between the interatrial septum and the interventricular septum. There is a slight override of the mitral valve annulus over this. You see, you notice that the mitral valve is sitting over the ASD a bit. That's why your right ventricle is a little smaller. So, this is a primum ASD with MR with an LVRA jet because this uh, this mitral valve annulus is actually overriding your ASD a bit. So your whole, it's causing your cleft to actually become an LDRA jet. Okay, everybody sees that overriding annulus? Are you understanding what I'm saying? Let me see that here. Now look at your annulus. Let me try and annotate that if I can. Let's see your annulus here and the, the interatrial septum seems to come in the middle of the mitral valve annulus. This is what is called an overriding annulus and this is what can lead to a slightly smaller right ventricle because if we look at this right you should be having a dilated RV right if your primary lesion is a primum ASD but here instead of that look at your RV it's smaller so important when you're looking and you get you know you see the primum ASD then you see the cleft you need to also be looking at hey my right ventricle should be dilated why is my RV actually smaller and this is actually related to the fact that the annulus is overriding. Okay, spotter diagnosis. Common atrium and what should you look for on an echo? So you see this, this is a, there's no in atrial septum at all, this is a common atrium. What are the things you should look for on an echo in a common atrium? So cleft and MR. Yes, next. Other associated things with common atrium. Unroofed PS, yes. Inlet VSD is okay, but generally when we say common atrium, we mean that it's purely at the atrial level. 
cytis. Why is cytis important? Why are pulmonary veins in all? What happens? What is the cytis? What is the systemic and pulmonary venous anomaly? You said cleft, you said undue CS, what else? They can have heterotaxy. What drainage? Which one can be abnormal drainage? Abnormal drainage of pulmonary veins. What about systemic veins? So, you can get a whole gamut, yes. You can get systemic venous anomalies, the they are draining abnormalities. You can get heterotaxies, you can occasionally get pulmonary veins. IVC interruption is rather unusual. Uh, it's more systemic venous uh, drainage anomalies, more heterotaxy. And you can have a cleft. So, very important when you get a combination to look very carefully at where's your SVC draining, where's your IVC draining. Where is your, do you have bilateral SVC? If you have a left SVC, is the cornu sinus roof or unroof? And of course, your cleft. If you have a doubt about the systemic wing, you're not sure about the SVC, how can you assess this? You don't know if it's roofed or unroofed. How can you assess it? You can do a contrast echo, and that is the answer I wanted. Please don't tell me CT and CAT is the first answer. You can do a contrast echo into which arm? Contrast echo into left arm and yes. You do the contrast echo and you will see the bubbles coming into the left atrium rather than going through it and into the right atrium. And it's important to define a room for unroofed shears because otherwise when your surgeon goes in to operate, I mean, he's going to look at it, but it, it's better if he's planned because he's got to roof it again or he has to decide whether he wants to ligate off the left SCC if it's small or if it's, he can, you know, if, does he want to just put the left SCC into the appendage. So these are all the issues that have to be answered. So when you have combinatory, you need to be looking for all these things before sending the patient to the OR. Okay. Next question, diagnosis. Just watch out for the light on. Very good. So it's a penetrated. Uh, it's not an SVC one. Now, if you look here, look at the first view. When you tip up, tip up, tip up, tip up. Mm, yes, it looks sinusinosis, I see in that view. I take that back. No, not in this view though, right? So this is a, see when you look up, and the best view is a subcostal sagittal, but when you look up and you see your SVC, you find the same system there. But when you look at this ASD, you have multiple jets there, right? So this is a multi penetrated So how can you treat this ASD? So what would you do? How would you treat this ASD? Single ASD device would be very, it would be difficult. See, when you do a, how do you decide you can do it with a single device? So if you, if you have, right, let me put another color so it's easier for you to see. If this is your atrial septum, Right? Say you have a hole here. Like in this case, you have a hole here, you have a hole here, and you have a hole here. Right? And you put a device here. It should be able to, the distance between here and the end of this ASD here, there should be 7 mm for it to cover. Right? So if the, if the distance between that one ASD and the end of the other ASD, 7 mm, 7 mm, yes, one device will cover it. If the distance is more than that, it's not going to cover it. Now, in this case, if you see, he's got a, the other issue that happens is, if your central ASD is somewhat, say, 4 mm or 5 mm, you can't put bigger than an 8 or 10 mm device. So, will that be able to cover the whole septum, right? So, these become the challenges with single ASD device in a fenestrated ASD. So one option is surgical, because with surgical you can close it off. The other option is you have a, a device that you can use for penetrated ASD. 
which has a very narrow waist and then it covers the whole septum. What, which one is that? Anyone? What is that called? So which kind of device can you use for a fenestrated AST? Anyone? Bonus point that makes PPSI. So, this one. This is a cribriform device, yes. So the waist, as you see, is very narrow. And then on either side, the disc. What are the sizes? The size of the waist is 2-3 millimeters. What is the size of the disc? Anyone? You guys have used or not used here? So you can have a 25 mm or a 35 mm. Okay, and the waist is 3 mm. The disc at 25 or 35. So if you're all the ASDs together come to 20, like come to 25 mm, you can use a 25. If they're like 28, 29 mm from this side to this side to this side, then you put the 35 mm device. So the cribriform device used for mm -hmm. penetrated ASD. Okay. Okay, next one. This is really, you think this is, oh, no picture? Oh. No, you can't see it. Can you see? So when would you operate on this? You can see there's a little AV septum, so it's a low secundum. You would operate if he has recurrent stroke. Okay, he has no stroke. So PS, so what do you mean by high risk? This is a low secundum ALG. So yes, if he had a paradoxical embolus, but he is asymptomatic. So would you operate on this patient? If you saw this echo, would you operate on this patient? No need to operate. Why no need to operate? Because there is no right heart dilation. That's right. It's a small secundum ALG which is restrictive. Look at your right ventricle. Look at your left ventricle. RV is not dilated. If there is no right heart dilation, there is no need to close. Um, and I cannot tell you the number of second opinions I get for this because I've only become a second opinion cardiologist these days. And mostly it's this. They have a 4 mm ALG, 5 mm ALG, no RARV dilation, no symptoms, and someone has recommended device closure or surgery. So please remember the indication for closure is presence of right heart dilation. You cannot have no right heart dilation but develop PH. Because first RA will get dilated, then RV, then pulmonary artery will get more flow. So without right heart dilation, you're not going to get pulmonary hypertension. So there's no right heart dilation, no need to close, only indication to closure is if you have paradoxical embolus, you know, something else, like, like in a PFO. Remember, one out of five people in the world has a PFO. We don't catch every guy on the street with a PFO and close his PFO, right? We only have certain specific indications to close PFOs. It's basically related to paradoxical embolus. If they haven't had a paradoxical embolus and they don't have right heart dilation, there is no need to operate. This one, when would you operate? You can see it's a secundum ASD. It's measuring about 14 millimeters. It's a large secundum ASD. When would you like to operate? When I say operate, you may choose to do device. But when would you intervene? So you could do two years. Any other? Do you have, you want to wait till three? So preschool. If you look at the National Committee guidelines, they will tell you two to five years. And I know in India we do a lot of this at two years. I will tell you if you go to the US and do your fellowship, they'll do all of these at four to five years. Okay? So the range of operating a secundum ASD is two to five years. Preschool. So if you saw a patient at two years and they had this, and they were asymptomatic, gaining weight, running around, no, nothing, you could wait another year. What is the benefit of waiting? Well, child will be bigger. There is also no downside to waiting. Unlike in a large BSD, if you wait, you get isolated. In a large BSD, from two years to three years, you are not going to get isolated. So an asymptomatic child with a secundum ASD, you can wait and operate it four to five years of age. Uh, same two, three-year child 
who's got symptoms, that means they're not gaining weight, they're getting frequent respiratory infections. Sure, go ahead and operate. So when you are asked, when will you close the secondum ALP, the answer is between two to five years. Now, two year or five year will depend on the patient. So having some symptoms, some poor weight gain, two, three years, totally asymptomatic, gaining weight, didn't even know, five, four to five years. Is that clear? So it's always better to just give a range. Give a range of two to five years for secondum ASP. Okay, all clear on that? Okay, next one. You have a patient, right heart dilation, but intraatrial septum appears intact. Which kind of ASD is often missed on a foot? Sinus remissus. So if you have right heart dilation, IS appears intact, please go look at the ECG. What is ECG going to show you? Negative P in area. But go back and look at your echo. What is the best view for a sinus venosus ASD? Is what is the best view? Is the bifurcal view. This view, the subcostal sagittal view, looking up, and there you go. You see the SVC and you see your defect. If you still can't see it, say the windows are not poor. How will you diagnose the sinus venosus ASD? Thank you. Trans esophageal echo is the answer. So sinus venosus is very hard to diagnose on contrast echo. You can, but again, you, you, you can. You can do a contrast echo, and what you see is you'll see some bubbles going to the left atrium. But you, uh, trans esophageal echo is a very good way to diagnose sinus venosus ASD. As you know, they're always associated with which PAP we see? Sinus venosus ASD is associated with which partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection? It is right upper PAP VC. So that's right. Okay, next question. Okay, sorry, this is just another example of that. We, just, we answered this already. Best echo views for ANG. Overall, which is the best echo view? For ASD, bicable is one basically a subcostal view. Yes. Which view can you get a false dropout? Where it looks like an ASD but it's not. Yes, four chambers. So I think your best views are your subcostal. You can look on short axis, you can look on long axis tipping down, but you get false dropouts in four chambers. So if you see vegan ASD in four chamber but you don't see it in subcostal, it is most likely not there. This is again the commonest mistake. I have recently seen two patients from corporate hospital in Bangalore referred for cardiac surgery. Patient the second opinion. It was just a 2D dropout on four chamber. So if you see two, four chamber something looking like ASD, forget about it. You've got to confirm it on your subcostal view. If it's not there on subcostal, it's not there. You don't have good subcostal windows. Look on long axis tipping down. Look on short axis and get a TEE, so you're sure before you refer a patient for closure. Okay, I think I'll end with this question. What is Raghib syndrome? But I won't go into management now of ALD since it's pretty late in the So, CSALD, or what we say, which is basically your unroot CS is a left SPC. Right? So, this is your your baby, it, the flow comes through the left atrium, through the CF, and into the right atrium. Typically, there's a left SCC associated. So this again will be a, a situation of interatrial septum looks intact, but right heart is dilated. And so when you interrogate your CF, and therefore it's a good idea to always get an habit in four chamber view, tip it down, look at your coronary sinus. Make sure it's good. Make sure it's not a coronary sinus type of ASD. Okay. All clear. I shall end with that. And um, see you Thursday. I hope our 